All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Emily Springer. I'm an academic trainer in the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I am thrilled to be able to have one of our very own NU employees, Dr. Meg Roberts, academic coach and proofreader uh, coordinator joining us today for our session is going to be entitled Becoming a Scholarly Editor. So our CTL webinar series has moved to a skill up series and, and through this process, uh, just to keep you all informed, we've moved to a meeting format. It's great to be able to see your faces. It's a little bit more interactive this way. Um, so just a few things have changed on this platform. We do not have a Q&A. So if you have questions, please go ahead, um, pop that in the chat for us. And as always, we are open to your feedback. So once you do receive um, the link at the very end of today's session, uh, feel free to provide us any feedback that you uh, are observing from our new, our new series. So as always, we are recording our, our, our webinar today, and I will pop that on our YouTube channel as well for future reference. That being said, I think, Dr. Roberts, that entails all of my housekeeping items. So I would, I'd like to turn this over to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much for setting us up and highlighting this new format that we get to have this interaction opportunity. So I'm going to be using a PowerPoint to help guide myself um, to just focus on a few ideas. And I love the visual aid. I think that's important for myself. And if I was teaching in a classroom, it wouldn't be hovering behind me. So occasionally you may see me venture towards it behind me. So I am coming to you from Portland, Oregon, where it is about 40 degrees, so frosty. And I am surrounded by tea, candles, heater, and a blanket. So all the good things of winter are supporting me right now. As was shared, my name is Dr. Meg Roberts, proofreading coordinator, I'm one of the academic coaches. I've been part of National for two and a half years now, shifted here from another university uh, where I got to work with graduate students as well. So I'd like to start by just sharing a little bit about myself because clearly I show off who I am. So I like to call myself a professional nerd who runs marathons. I've earned a Bachelor of Arts in Religion, Master's in Theology and Higher Education, changed my mind what I wanted to be when I grew up, and then my doctorate in Higher Education from Azusa Pacific University in Southern California. My different universities gave me chances to learn in different ways. Whitworth, my first one was traditional, on campus, living in the residence halls. Geneva was a cohort style, one net a week, as well as an internship. Western was part-time in-class, part-time online. And Azusa was hybrid, where I was traveling to Southern California twice a year. Fabulous in January, a little more of a struggle in July, but still not going to complain. Outside of those pieces, I work full-time with National. I also teach part-time with Warner Pacific here in Portland, Oregon. I get to teach research design, and I'm just wrapping up a communication theory course as well. And then, like I said, run marathons. So the other pictures I've got on there include my very first picture from about 15 years ago of 5K, the Starlight Run, and from my most recent marathon, the Portland Marathon. I'm not fast but endurance. And I've learned a lot through running about education and about my own journey and supporting others on it. Because he's not here and he can't stop me. I'm sharing a picture of my husband. We've been married about a year and a half now, met online just uh, shortly before the pandemic. So we did a long distance relationship for about a year. And then he moved to Portland and we got married in May, 2021. And outside of these pieces, I volunteer with Foster Parents Night Out. It's an amazing program. If you're interested in supporting foster kids, check it out. See if it's in your world. I write for a running blog, and then I'm part of our social media. So just all the pieces. Again, professional nerd runs marathons. That's me at my core. In the session, really what I want to do is offer ideas on how to improve your editing skills. There will absolutely be time for questions. I'm going to make sure I pause a couple times in here um, so that if there's questions that are part of the chat that Emily's sharing with us, but also just as part of what I've planned myself is takeaways because 
this matters. And it's part of how we communicate whatever our message is. All of you have something that you're passionate about. And it's probably not APA or grammar or formatting. Very legit. Totally. Professional nerd here saying, I get it. It's not what I'm most passionate about. There's a lot of other things that I am. And I recognize that those pieces, those editing pieces help others to recognize and appreciate what I am passionate about. So as an example, my stepfather has a 1977 uh, Mustang Cobra in his storage unit. It's a lovely car. It's a classic. It was his first car. He's put a lot of work into it, replaced lots of parts and all of this. And if you went to go look at it right now, it is covered in dust and surrounded by tubs and boxes and other things. And so if someone were to open up my parents' storage unit and be like, make us an offer on this car, you know, 20 bucks, I don't know, it's whatever you're going to pay for the junk, they wouldn't recognize the value that's hidden underneath the really good thing. And that can happen with us, with our writing. If the spacing's off, if the fonts are different, if the colors are weird, these things that you're like, oh, why does this matter? It's about what I wrote. Because they're not even getting to what you wrote. They're getting distracted by the dirt, by the tubs, by all these other things that we got to invest a little bit of time in. Not as much time as you put in the content. It's always going to be less than that, but it matters and it's going to help. So I want to go through couple of best practices and then take a pause to check in on questions. So first one, this is my number one suggestion for anybody improving your writing. Read your work out loud. What I did when I was working on my writing papers, still do it when I'm getting to write for a blog or someone else, I will print off a copy of my document, whatever I'm working on, and I will carry it around with whatever color pens I feel like for that day. To read it out. Read it like a speech. Read it as though you are standing, you're ready for that standing ovation. Lean into all that fun. As you're going, if there's things that sound wrong, unclear, if you get, if you have a sentence that you can't make it through without taking a breath, that's your body helping you know <laughs> this got to change. But read it through. A couple of reasons for this. One, I'm having you print it off, suggesting you print it off versus on your screen. So that you don't go down a rabbit hole fixing it right then. That's not what we're doing right now. We're just catching, th catching things. You just want to mark them off. You'll come back around to fix it. Reading it out loud, your body will help you. There are words that you can stumble through in your mind. Just like if you're walking around your home, you know where that little trip it places in the carpet, but somebody else walking through, they're not going to find it. So when we're reading through a paragraph or a paper over and over and over again, and then suddenly you read it out loud. That's not the word I meant. And spell check didn't catch that. That's going to help you out. And reading it out loud. It's just kind of funny, especially leaning into it of like uh, as grand as you can possibly make it or whatever style you want to do, whatever's going to just, you know, have some fun. Second best practice I recommend knowing your own stuck spots, knowing your common issues for me. Very first paper I wrote for my dissertation, uh, for my doctorate, they gave it back with feedback and the uh, reviewer said that I was the queen of anthropomorphisms. And I did not know what that word meant. So I asked if that meant I got a crown. She laughed. No crown. But she did help me understand that what I was doing wrong is I was giving human characteristics to objects. I was saying colleges should do this. Universities need to do that. And as that reviewer explained, college and universities basically are buildings. They can't do anything. They can't propose. They can't seek. They can't hope. You gotta have people. Got it. So I knew that was an area of issue for me. So I kept a note, a little notepad by my computer. What were my common issues? Anthropomorphisms, passive language, misusing while and although, misusing that and which. I just had a little note card. And so I didn't try and fix it as I was writing. I just want to get words on the page. But once I did, once I'd have a paragraph, maybe a couple pages, I'd check out my notepad. What are some of those issues? Go back to my writing and figure it out. Somebody else, they, they're going to have different issues, different problems than I did. So I just got to know what's my piece. 
And then the last one before checking on questions, when possible, as much as possible, give yourself a day between when you've written your paper and when you go back to do some editing, letting everything settle a little bit. If you write it and immediately read it over, you are not going to be aware of everything that's on that page. You're going to still be thinking, well, here's what I intended. And also maybe have some emotional connection, a lot more than what you'd have if you gave it a day or two of distance. With like recorded sessions and proofreading we do through the ASC, you get your feedback a couple of days later. And I think a benefit of that is that it's not fresh. It's that chance when you get that feedback, it's like a, a little bit of a delayed reaction. So I know for myself, I always try to do any of my writing, any of my projects over at least two days taking my notes, writing my outline on day one, and then doing the actual writing on day two. And if it's a big project, doing editing on day three, because that night of rest gives that chance to let everything settle a little bit, get some new ideas, maybe have something come up in my subconscious or an experience where I'm like, that's it. That's that piece I wanted to connect and I couldn't figure it out yesterday. Now I know. So reading out loud, knowing yourself, giving yourself time. Okay. Want to check in, Emily, any questions to hit so far before I keep moving on? <clears throat> yeah. I'm, I think this is, a, this is a, this may be something that you'll cover just as tips for how to be less resistant. So what do you do if you are resistant to editing? Resistant to editing? Well, First off, remembering that what you're working on right now, it's not your last great work. That's something that I remember my chair telling me when I was working on my dissertation. This is not your last great work. This is not the last thing you're ever going to write. This is not the best thing you're ever going to write. It is just a thing. And so that can help a little bit. I know there are pieces of, especially my dissertation, that were like, oh, I put blood, sweat, tears into that. I love that. And especially my second committee member did not love it. And my, my chair would say was, well, what do you really want to fight for? And there were some things I really wanted to fight for. There was a metaphor that I had connecting to a TV show that I was like, I love this. This is essential. This was my breakthrough moment, but a lot of other things. Okay. And maybe it's not fitting because it's a little too casual or it's not fitting because it doesn't, it's not quite, quite on topic. I'm going to save that for something else. I actually started blogging a lot while I was writing my dissertation as an outlet, as kind of a way to be like, well, they won't let me what I want, write what I want to. I'm just going to completely write anything I want over here with absolutely no editing and really no audience. That's fine. Um, and remembering that the feedback that anyone else is giving you, they're trying to help. They really are. This is not malicious. This is not evil. No one hates you or anything like that. They're trying to do the best possible work with and for you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Uh, one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, something came up in the chat before we move on. Grammarly does not recognize anthropomorphisms. Mm -hmm. What are some practices to catch them while editing? Got it. Yes. Anthropomorphisms, you're absolutely right. So what I'll do sometimes is I will, in my head, replace the noun with a different one that's clearly wouldn't work. So I was just reading this in someone's paper earlier this week, and it's totally normal. People will write, the study claimed, the article proposed, the uh, journal offered. Okay, replace that just in your head or literally on the page if it's helpful with like the piece of paper, the book, the rock, like replace the noun. Does it still work? Because some of those do. An article can't propose, but it can include because a piece of paper can include. So replacing it in your mind with another noun can help think, does this still work? I would offer that same idea when you're thinking about verbs in general, just thinking about, okay, if this was a different noun, because another, a, a really kind of side-by-side -side issue I get to see in students' writing is they'll include verbs that are really internal. The author believed, they hoped, they thought. You don't know. You know what they said, wrote, described, argued, proposed, observed, you know, huge list. But you do not know what's in their heart. 
kind of like, you do not know what's in my heart right now. You could tell someone you went to this session and here's what Dr. Roberts said, and here's what she joked and offered and proposed and promoted and all sorts of things. You don't know what I believe. Theoretically, I could be thinking, ha ha ha, this is all ridiculous hogwash. Pretty silly what my career is, but I could, and you don't know. So we need to use observable verbs when we're talking about our authors and really focusing on the humans. Who is doing the actual work? Because college universities, they're just buildings, articles, studies, journals, pieces of paper. So just remembering what are those things, things, and what can those things do? And what do people need to do? Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Go. Cool. Okay. I'll keep going and then check in with you again. So at the core of scholarly writing is the argument that we're making. And a struggle with that a lot of, for a lot of us is trying to figure out how do we have support for that? How do we make sure that what we're saying matters and that they'll believe us. You, as the author, you're the attorney. This is just a metaphor that I, I learned from a faculty member, loved it, I've adopted and share it with you now. So you are the attorney. And since you're the attorney, that means you can't be the witness. So this little cartoon, in case it's a little too small. In closing, I would like to remind the jury that he says he didn't do it. If you stood before a jury and told them, he's innocent. Thank you. Sat down. Well, the other attorney could say, he's guilty. Thank you. And sit down. All right. You got nothing. You have to have evidence. But as the attorney, your job is, on, is structure, is argument, is on helping your jury, your audience understand. So instead, you have to connect to the original sources. It can't be about you, even if it's something you already know. Let's imagine bank robbery and you happen to have been a witness. You can't be both. You have to pick one or the other. So if you're the attorney, it can't fit in what you saw that day. It has to be all about what other people saw. So if it's information that you already know, I, for example, know that Dante Alighieri hit, wrote the Divine Comedy using a, a brand new rhyme scheme that integrated all the way through the entire piece so that it was connected to demonstrate the perfection of God. I know that because I read a whole bunch of books about Dante for my master's thesis. And if I was going to include that in the paper now, even though it's part of my brain, even though I understand and I could, I could demonstrate to you the rhythm of it, I would still need to go back to one of those books. So it's not just Meg telling you that it's another source as well. So reading your paper with that lens of how do you know? Maybe even have someone else look it over for you. Someone who doesn't know anything about your topic can be really useful. I, one of my editors knew nothing about my topic, knew APA though. So was able to catch me on things and ask questions about content. How did I know? You're connecting back to the original resource. If it's a paraphrase, if it's an idea from another author, then you just need to have the author and the year. If it's an exact quote, in that case, you got to have that page number because that gives your reader context. And that is one of the key words I learned in, in grad school, context. And one that I think I include in my proofreading feedback every single time. So with a paraphrase, when you're trying to just connect your reader with the original author, you can say, just started reading this one last night. You can say, you know, Obama 2022 described how her life has uh, taught her different skills to develop resilience and hope. Great. Obama 2022. It's somewhere in this book. But if it's an exact quote, we sat and talked for a while after that. Both of us recognized how much that one thing actually mattered. In that case, I got to give the page number because it's not just in general. It's a specific spot and I'm equipping my reader. I'm helping them. I think that that helps me to think about why citations and references matter. Just like some of those formatting things matter because I want my reader to appreciate that beautiful content I have underneath. Citations and references matter because I'm equipping my reader. I'm helping them get connected to that original source and not be like, it's in there somewhere. You'll figure it out. Instead, Nope, that was on page 221. So they can go find out more and they can also go learn. Oh, Meg knew what she was talking about. She didn't, you know, speak out of turn and 
just fake it. Okay, I want to go through this one and check in again on questions. So technology, I'm not going to go wild and crazy on technology. My wonderful mother, love her. In case she ever sees this video, love you, mom, very much. Coming home for Christmas. So with her and technology, she will learn it when she has to. And so anytime that there's something about technology I want her to learn, it's basically like I have to also give her like, here's why. <laughs> and bare minimum. So I don't teach her all the tricks I know. I'm like, I'm going to give you the key ones, the ones that are just going to take her a step forward. For example, I kept seeing her do screenshots of photos that I would text her. Like I would send her a photograph and she would screenshot it. And I'm like, you, there's a way to save that to your phone that doesn't include the time and date at the top, mom. Let me, let me just help you. I want to do that here. I want to cover just a couple of key ideas that you may already know. If so, fabulous. Awesome. Use this as an opportunity to drink a little coffee, tea, whatever. So find the find function. It's so simple. Folks don't realize that find function. It can search for words. It can also search for spaces. Depending on your age, you might have been taught that you're supposed to have two spaces after punctuation. The rules changed in fall 2020 with APA 7th edition. So in your lovely find function in find your place, ah, uh, in case you can't see it, Emily's holding up the APA manual. Da -da -da. Where once it was, Warrior. you could use two spaces as oh, a raft. Now we have to, two spaces after punctuation. So what you can do in your find function is you can, and if you have a Mac or a PC, it's a little bit different, but either way, they both do this. You can literally put in period, space bar, space bar into the find and replace it with a period, space bar, replace all. And I would say replace all a couple times until it says it's done zero. Then I would search for space bar, space bar. Because sometimes in our writing, we will accidentally put two spaces between words that we didn't mean to. Or we will do spaces for our indentations instead of tab. These are little things. I get that. But they're also stuff that sometimes our lovely faculty members are like, this isn't right. Or going back to my stepdad's busting, distract. So use find. Use find for the space issue. I would also suggest to help out with some of your writing, search for the word of, and also search for wimpy words, verbs, wimpy words, wimpy verbs, like is, was, were, am, has. Those are often around passive language. So checking for those. You're not gonna get rid of all of them. You're not gonna get rid of all your ofs. You're not gonna get rid of all your wimpy verbs. Try and cut it by half. Give a minute to a sentence to fix it. If you can't in a minute, move on, let it go, try again later, or just, it's going to be better. Anything you can do will make it better. If you are in, say, dissertation phase, and you're shifting from proposal to manuscript, you got to go back through and find future tips. So searching for the word will, you got to fix that too. You got to change all that future tense to past or present, depending on the context. Okay, there's more things you can do, but seriously, it's a nice little thing. Layout. So the Microsoft template, I do not know why. Bill Gates did not ask me, but the Microsoft template includes a little bit of extra space between paragraphs and it is so easy to fix and so annoying. You go up to layout, like I've got this on the screen. It's a menu that's up across the top. You click on the layout tab and then you wanna make sure that in the spacing that it's zero point before and after. So you could select your whole document, all the words in your document, select all, and make sure that it's zero point before and after. You still want your words, your sentences to all be double spaced, but this is gonna get those, those random little spaces between paragraphs, that's gonna get rid of them. You could set up a new template if you want, that's a little bit farther down the, tra the trail. So if you wanna Google that, YouTube that, you can do it. But this one, anytime you got some faculty member that's like, there's extra space here, Check this out, check that, make sure those are both zeros. Last one I wanted to offer, when you're getting feedback from your faculty member or ASC or a peer, you might be sometimes like, what's the stupid red line on the side? Why is there a red line here? How do I make this go away? Or your faculty member, someone's like, I need a clean copy. And you're like, I have no idea what you mean. It might be that there's some track changes that are on that document. If, for example, 
I get to work with the proofreading proofreading service. If students send a paper to us, we send back a reviewed copy of it using track changes. And with track changes, there's different ways you can see it. If it's simple markup, then it's only showing the comments on the side and those red lines for anywhere that we made changes. All markup shows those comments and anywhere that I deleted a word or added a word or moved a word or anything. So going up here into the tabs, review and switching from simple, you can switch to simple markup, all markup, original to see what it looked like once upon a time when I first saw it. You can also, if you click on that red line, that also switches it between simple markup and all markup. Sometimes I have a really hard time getting my mouse right on that line. So I was, I loved when I figured out that I could just click between these two because it's a much bigger bullseye for my uh, mouse to click on. Okay, pausing again. Lovely, Emily. Thoughts, awesome. questions? First of all, great tips on that. Um, <laughs> I think we could probably use an entire skill up series on just those pieces itself, but let me scroll up here. Okay, so um, this goes back to the previous slide um, about making sure that you cite or citation is, is needed. Um, is there any order of hierarchy for references? So scholarly, peer-reviewed, et cetera, does it matter? Mm. Well, scholarly, peer-reviewed, same thing, basically. Yep. Those are, those are synonyms. Um, but as far, so like hierarchy, a lot of times in our assignments, uh, professors, you look in this course syllabi, they're going to want those scholarly peer reviewed. That means they've gone through that extra process mm -hmm. to be approved. They're in academic journals. You're getting them through the national library. That's what you're going to be wanting to use high majority. I'm saying somewhere in the mid to upper nineties in your, in your papers. Right. Some assignments are going to have a required number. You have to use at least this many. Other resources, such as more popular media, New York Times, for example, something like that would be if it's something really contemporary that you're wanting that in your paper you're wanting to show it's happening right now mm -hmm. and for it hasn't been studied yet. Those are usually more like I need to be able to just demonstrate it's a present issue. Government websites where I'm just showing statistics and things like that. So high majority, like I said, mid to upper nineties are gonna be those scholarly peer reviewed. That's what they're looking for because we know that is reliable. We know the amount of work that went into that compared to what was published on um, in the Washington Post or something like that. Okay. And then just um, Michael, if you wanna expand any further on that, but just in general, when I have, um done my papers, I've used my ref works and then I've highlighted the ones that I need to put into my ref works um, or my references section and then do create bibliography. That's been very successful for me in terms of a, an order in my papers. Um, you, you're asking me if I had wanted to elaborate on the question. Yes, go for it. Yeah, yeah I was really just to, um, you know, sometimes there's multiple sources on a particular topic and uh, if I'm drilling down to decide, you know, which to, to use or reference, just in my mind, I'm wondering if there's more, any is more weighty than any other. And I think the response just given definitely helps uh, a bit, but uh, yeah, just any other tips with regard to, you know, uh, how to leverage those references, which ones take uh, supremacy. Sounded sure. like the scholarly and peer review, typically, unless there's another reason. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly there's ones we're thinking about, okay, highlighting in the last five years, recognizing how much things change. Um, also, if it's a resource that's been referred to by a lot of other authors, and the way you figure that out is just by reading more. It's just you, there are names that you are going to see come up over and over and over again. For myself, my degree, my career has been working in higher education, adult higher education. So Malcolm Knowles. Knowles comes up over and over and over again. Brookfield comes up over and over and over. Erickson. Um, yeah. They're just names that you're just going to see. And you're going to want to make sure I'm including those key authors because those who are experts will be looking for them, will be thinking like, whoa, why didn't you write about this one? And your readers who are novices, who are brand new, they need you. They need you to help understand who are the key resources, who are the key voices for this work. 
Absolutely. And thank you, Michael, for your question. Um, I hope that helps. If well, to, to piggyback that, um, one thing I've noticed is that many of those um, have uh, publications that are beyond the five year mark. And so that's what I struggle with a lot. And a lot of those names, their research is dated, but yet it's still popular and quoted frequently. And yet we have the criteria of trying to stay within that five year parameter. Get that. What's your recommendation for navigating such a situation? So if it's a, a resource that's beyond five years, uh, two thoughts. One is just talking with your faculty member, see if this is a resource that's worthy of them, in their opinion. The other is for those resources that are older, for example, um, uh, Paolo Freire is, is one that I will use in some of my teaching and writing. His last book was in the late 60s. Okay, well, well outside that five-year span. So who in the last five years has also referenced him? That's kind of the bridge. That shows that it's not me alone trying to dig up this ancient resource but others are still recognizing how relevant Freire's work is. So that gives me that piece of like, not only sharing Freire's uh, critical pedagogy focused on um, how our awareness of, of needs in the world is a necessary opportunity for our education. I can also say, here's some authors who have highlighted how Freire's work is still relevant in the 22nd, 21st? 21st century. <laughs> okay, now. so another... In other words, uh, just maybe like cross-reference, uh, I, I guess we're looking for where he's been cited. Right, and within the past there's five years. Okay, there's that. And just an exactly. FYI, many of the references that are in the instructions that we're given yeah. are all beyond that five-year period too. So that's kind of a paradox, right? We go up there and they say, here's the homework instructions. Make sure your stuff's not, you know, is within yeah. five years. And all of the reference sources that were given for instructions are beyond five years. I'm like, huh. <laughs> you passed the test. Well done catching that irony. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Um, let me see here. A couple of things about, I want to move to this, this slide that we have right here. Just a couple of questions about this. If you submit a clean copy for revision to committee, will they be able to see the previous track changes or does that need to stay on? Usually clean copy means they want it you to have accepted all track changes. You might want to double check with the committee of if, if their definition. But if you, for example, you it's hidden by my little my little image right now, what, what I have on the screen, but there's a accept all. If you have accepted all the changes, they're gone. They are they are erased just like if you had a bruise and it's healed over, done. So you can't get those back again once you've accepted or rejected them. If you mark them as resolved, that basically makes the change or comment like a little bit lighter, but it's still there. So you might want to check with your committee, just make sure that your definition of clean and theirs is the same. Because once you accept or reject changes or comments, invisible, they're all gone. Okay. And then one last piece on this. And then if we have some time, there's a few other things. Oh. If we have time at the end, I know we have more slides to cover. So yeah, I'm, I'm just going to do one more piece on this um, slide. And I think it's going to be check with your committee members, but so do we send the document with no markup to give a clean copy to our committee members? They could make that switch themselves. So I wouldn't say that's what they're going to want. If they want clean copy, I would, I mean, I would check with them to be like, okay, yeah. so you want me to resolve, you want me to, to, to accept or reject all changes. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's what they want. Cause switching it to no markup, that's just one of four options. I could switch a document to any of those four. So if I send it as no markup, they could switch it to simple markup or all, or it doesn't, it's like I've, it's like with a child, I'm just thinking how with, they think that they've gone invisible. It's like, you can't see me, I'm invisible. It's like, no, you're not, you're just, you're, you're still just there. there. <laughs> you can see ya. That's what no markup does, is a blanket over your head. So if they want clean copy, most likely they want you to have resolved all the track changes but double check, just answer, just make sure. Okay, so you want me to accept, reject all changes? Yes, no. And hopefully they're not like my 
wonderful husband who sometimes I have to kind of swirl around two or three times to get to that yes or no answer, but you will get there. Okay. And then I'm so sorry that since we're on markup, at what point in the study should you most likely pay attention to the markup portion of Microsoft Word dissertation level or your- Oh, know. like the little squiggly lines? Yeah. Oh, I, well, I turn off the squiggly lines while I'm writing my papers. They drive me nuts because otherwise I have to fix it right then. Okay. I mean, but I spell check and grab, I do all those things at every level um, okay. of my writing, even just checking my emails and stuff because I want to keep in good patterns. So all the time. <laughs> yeah, all the time. There's a difference. I mean, there's definitely certain like there's levels of crazy. I say crazy <laughs> okay. Because right? I'm saying about myself. You know, I have found that I started... So per APA, paragraphs have to be at least three sentences. And I found myself writing emails that are always at least three sentences. I've gotten into that pattern. I just can't write a two sentence paragraph, even on the commons. No one cares on the commons, but I've just, I, it, it feels wrong now. I've been guiding it so much. you've been ingrained in doing it. Uh, this I way, am. Yes. Best practices, right? Practice. Why not? Yes. Um, but I, but every once in a while, I will just be like, oh, just hit send. It's, it, no one knows. <laughs> so just try to keep those good patterns. That's why I recommend for students who are maybe working on chapter one or working on a course assignment, you know, fixing those formatting errors about references and citations and those things. Because at some point later, when you're working on a capstone, when you're working on a big project, just have those, those rhythms set in is so important. You don't, don't, don't want to be trying to make something brand new. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. There was a few yeah. more things in the chat that I hope we can get to later, but I, oh. I want to make sure that you were able to cover the slide. Maybe I'll be covering it. We'll find out. Cool. Okay. So this piece, just thinking about with scholarly editing, a piece of it is about how, how to set up your structure, your, your context to support yourself. I already mentioned earlier about just like knowing yourself as in creating that, that uh, list on the side, you know, that index card or post it. I do an index card all the time. I'll talk about them in a minute of issues of problems that you're like, I know I got to check this, but also knowing yourself of like, when am I best at writing? When do I struggle? What are the things that I'm good at knowing your strengths and recognizing how you can lean into them versus some of your weaknesses. So I finally figured it out. It took me a very long time to admit, to recognize, to see it, to, to live into it. Um, when it comes to writing, I can write about one or two paragraphs and then I have to do something else. It's like my brain needs to reset or for the older computers, defragment. I just can't. After about two paragraphs, if I, if I just keep sitting at my computer just to keep writing, nothing's going to happen. I'm going to stare at my computer and it's going to be blank or I'm going to write things that I will be deleting minutes after. I have friends, I have colleagues who can write for hours. I don't know how. I, does my brain cannot do that? So I have to figure out who what do I do? So for me, when I was, you know, when I'm working on a big project, it's work a little bit on it every single day. I can't do a marathon day of writing. I can do a lot of things in a day, but I can't just write all day. It doesn't work. So instead, that led to me when I was in grad school, I would, every Sunday, I would make a little note card of here's what's happening in my week. And it was focused on my tasks for the week outside of work. Cause I was working full-time as an academic advisor at that time. And so I was looking at what do I need to do outside of that part? Like y'all, my assignments were due on Sunday. So it was a way to work backwards and figure out, okay, if this paper is due on Sunday, that means I want to make sure I have a final draft by this point so I can read it through. That means I need to have an outline, but this, so it's working backwards and also recognizing, are there any days this week where I'm working really late or I'm traveling or class or something like that so that I can piece these in. Now I still do this. I just do it as a daily. This is the last thing I, one of the last things I do before bed. Last night I wrote this note card and then I read the introduction to Obama. So that was my good night. Have a night, have a, have a nice Monday. Um, that helps me to reset my next day and to think about what are the pieces that I can move around? What are the pieces that are immobile? How do I help them fit together? So 
that helps in writing. That helps in editing. Because if I get that paper written earlier, say by Friday, and I'm doing my editing on Saturday, if I'm asking questions to my professor on Monday or Tuesday, that gives me lots of time to hear back without stress, without like, ah, pan anxious panic. So knowing who you are as a writer, as an editor, who you're a morning person, night person, how do you feel about Meg's suggestion of walking around reading your, reading your paper out loud as a speech? You got to know you. And last piece of this is knowing your village. So these three lovely ladies uh, sitting around me at my graduation, um, and last time I wore heels, they were my dissertation community. So if you're in, if you're in that stage, you have a dissertation committee. You got these three faculty members who are resources for you in guiding your content, and your writing. I knew I needed a couple other people in my life, so I asked these three uh, wonderful friends to be my dissertation community, and they were responsible for encouragement, for accountability. We're coming to my graduation and they just checked in on me. They had nothing to do with my content. They didn't, they didn't know it. Um, the one in the middle, Beth, she promised she would look at my dissertation and look in case y'all are curious, her definition of look, hmm, words, lots of words. Interesting. And at my graduation party, she did just that. None of them have read my dissertation. None of them have read any of my papers. That wasn't what I needed from them. I needed Coralie to offer to bring me groceries when I was just, I was single and I had food, but it would get to be kind of like, mm, how many days have I eaten corn pops this week? Too many. So she would bring me chili. She would bring me a meal. Beth, every time I got to a, a kind of a good point in my paper or finished a semester, she would give me a dollar store present and a Christmas card. Didn't matter what time of year. It was always Christmas card. I still have them all. Patricia lived in Southern California, about an hour and a half from where my school was. So every time I went down for school, I got to go visit her and her family uh, in San Diego for a couple of days. They helped me. They were my village. And I would encourage anybody, have those people around you, no matter what you're working on. If you're on dissertation, doctoral, master's, bachelor's, anything, people who can help you in these different parts of your, of your journey people who can read your paper, people who can offer you suggestions, people who can brainstorm with you. I've got a lovely friend, Thea, who she's just a really good um, coach in that way of just like asking those questions. You used to drive me bonkers, but now I've really learned how to lean into her and, and appreciate her for she's one of those where it's like, ah, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you want to do about that? And it's like, figure out what to do. She's lovely now. We're lovely now. We're having burgers later. So figuring out who those different people are in your life and how they can help you. You got to have that. Last thing, then any and all questions, love it. Got to include my key quote um, that is on my email. It's on my wall. The miracle isn't that I finished. The miracle is that I had the courage to start. It's by a runner named John Bingham. His nickname is the penguin because as he runs, he kind of waddles. Normal runner, normal guy. And I love this idea because for me, the scariest part is starting. I have a half marathon scheduled for this Sunday and my knee has been a little unhappy with me since about mid-summer. So I'm nervous about it. I'm nervous about how it's going to go, how long it's going to take, how much I'm going to have to walk, how cold it's going to be. Those fears will be a hundred times better once I pass the starting line. Because once I pass the starting line, there's really no option other than finish. And I find that with writing as well, or any new project. The hardest part is the blank page. So put a title on it, write a couple notes based on your assignment description or template or whatever. So it's not blank anymore. Hit save. You've started. You have something. Now it's just continuing forward using all the resources we have, using the people you have to be there with you along the way. Okay. Got a little bit about ASC I could share. Really would love to just focus on questions though. Yeah, I think we may want to um, share some of the pieces in the ASC. There are sure. just two things I want to 
to bring up and then Absolutely. I don't know if we'll be able to get to this question you can say no but if we have okay time, I am curious um th this is about the passive language um information so we're obviously told not to utilize passive language in the writing process but then when we move from the dissertation proposal to the dissertation manuscript Mm -hmm. um, we are told to change the language to past tense, mm -hmm. which is passive language. So um, as a, yeah, as a proofreader, how do you how do you question the passive tense mm -hmm. in the dissertation manuscript? Yeah. So with passive, part of it's just trying to make it as good as possible because there will be the problem to be explored in the study was, mm, oh, look, there's passive. It's going to be there. But how much can we remove because we want to keep our reader engaged because we want to often passive language can be tied with anthropomorphisms those can kind of go together with one another so it's trying to make it as good as possible and realizing perfect isn't possible and we're not trying that we're just trying for the best manuscript available to us so with those it's just like the, like i said if you're going through and looking for the wimpy verbs the ofs give it a minute per sentence, like really, truly, I'm just like, let it go, move on, get somebody else. Maybe if you're really stuck on it and you really want to make it better. Great. Mm -hmm. Also thinking about depending on your faculty member, APA allows first person. I interviewed, I coded, I did these things. Some professors prefer third person. They want it to be the researcher, check with them what their preference is. But that's another way that you can help in avoiding passive language and avoiding anthropomorphisms. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. I, this is, uh, from an editing standpoint, uh, this is a question in the chat. Um, a person is kind of struggle, struggling with exceptionally long, complicated sex, um, sentences. So making sure the paragraphs are just three sentences. Well, three, three is three a minimum, minimum, right? Is a minimum. minimum. Yes. Yes. What about for the folks that kind of you know, how do we make things a little bit more short and concise? What are some sure. recommendations for that? Absolutely. So three sentences is a minimum for a paragraph. Four to six is kind of your target. That's a good chunk. I used to lead our paragraph development group session with ASC. Someone else has, has taken over that opportunity. But the way I would describe it is a paragraph is like taking a bite at a potluck. And there's so many good things in a potluck, especially like a summer potluck where you got the burgers and the ice cream and potato salad and chips and watermelon and, and root beer and all the good things. And if you tried to put every single thing on your plate and then every single thing in your mouth, you would get every single thing down your shirt. So instead, you got to be like, I'm going to take a bite of my cheeseburger. And mm -hmm. for me, I'm a very simple girl with my cheeseburger. It tends to be just like cheese, pickles, mustard. I can be very simple and very happy. I'm just very content in that. Sometimes I'll throw some other things, but really that's my core, that's my core burger. A solid bite of that, a four to six sentence paragraph. I'm good. And then I can move on and eventually get down to the ice cream. With sentences, reading out loud is a way to help catch that. If you can't make it through the sentence without taking a breath too long. I've also been thinking about how with quotes and citations, uh, APA says if it's 40 words or more, that's a block quote and you got to format that differently. So I've been thinking about using that as just kind of a way to think about definitely too long when you're getting into block quote sentences. So if your sentence is 40 words, definitely got to cut that back. Um, is it all focused on one idea? So I think there's different ways to think about it, but reading out loud, number one suggestion, <laughs> If it has three conjunctions, if it has three different ands, ors, buts, mm, definitely cut, definitely pull that apart because right. you're putting too many ideas in there. Personally, I'm trying to remove the word but from my writing in general. I've been finding, trying to pull that out more and more because when you use the word but, then the second half of the idea kind of takes away the whole content of the first. Mm -hmm. I'm working on that in my own writing. Um, but read it out loud, check for conjunctions and check for number of words. Like just really, truly, is there 40 words? Does there need to be 40 words? Okay. And then um, we did have a question about the line that you were referencing. Oh, where, the red line? 
Yes. What does that even look like? What is that? What is that? Um, much like the line on the on the bottom bottom of my page here. Like you'll know when you see it. So if it's just a a vertical red line that shows up on the left side of your screen, what okay. that means is there is a track change somewhere in that line. Okay. The red, it's simple markup. It's kind of like it's hiding, but that, so that red signal is saying there's something hiding here. If you click on that and it goes to gray, then on the right side, you're going to see a little comment pop up that wasn't there before. That is the deleted, added, whatever was changed is now visible. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. And then I think, oh, just some tips here, tech tips for saving your documents. Um, yes, OneDrive, of course, we encourage that, but a few folks in the chat just saying different strategies that they do for saving their documents to make sure that they've got all their hard work saved. Oh, um, I, especially when I was late in dis uh, dissertation mode, I emailed it to myself. That was one of the tips. At least once a week, I was saving it on the cloud. I had everything synced up, saved on a jump drive so paranoid and worth it uh about good a month after i graduated my computer was stolen so after i graduated oh. after i graduated so i was all done computer was stolen so i was able to retrieve a lot of that work out of clouds in different places and now i have it i have an apple and i have everything on the cloud which was good yes. because when yeah, one of the broke. recommendations, Dr. Roberts, was to email your work to yourself as well, too, because I do that. So I just thought, well, that's a helpful tip to share as well. Too. You can just save in your drafts, even even just hit send, you know, just save it. Don't send it. Could. <laughs> I will do that sometimes when I worked in an office that was separate from my lovely home. I would email things to my work that I needed to print because that way work me would remember. Oh my gosh, Dr. Roberts, I can't help but kind of giggle at Zoanne's comment. And I'm only giggling, Zoanne, because this is a this is something I need to work on too. Um, she mentions I'm addicted to the semicolon. It's my favorite punctuation, but it does lead to long sentences. How do I get past the need to use the semicolon? Semicolons are supposed to be used when the that phrase afterwards really can't stand by itself it's not strong enough it needs so it's kind of sounds like maybe maybe the selenium for you a little like a crutch where that second half needs the first half and it can't be by itself if it can stand by itself as its own sense it should be period and if it can't you also want to think is it really adding to that first part of the sentence or I'm wondering how many times I could say let it go before the song starts in my head and I just hit that limit. So in case y'all are curious, it was it was about three. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what that's what a semicolon is supposed to do. Is it supposed to be like this, these can't stand by itself that second half? Mm. Do we really need it? Okay. And and Zoan, I just feel you on the semicolon <laughs> um struggle. But thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your your tip on that um, from an editing standpoint. I know we have just like a few minutes left. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Forgive me if I missed something, if it was scrolling through. Um, did you want to show just a few things for the Academic Center and then we'll wrap up? Yeah, I was just going to highlight. I took a couple screenshots from our page. I just wanted to make sure I highlighted this part of the resources for all you lovely folks um, because we do have so much. So just so many different parts of it. Um, so this is screenshots from our page. We have 35 weekly group sessions on a lot of different topics, introductions, APA, scholarly writing, um, paraphrasing, purpose statements, problem statements, synthesizing research, quant some that are focused on different aspects of statistics and quantitative in vivo. Our APA style section includes resources that are connected with APA manual, just really highlighting things like references, citations, headings. In the writing, I often link to that for students about paragraph structure, transitions. Through this, you can get information on how to get to academic writer, um, use that resource, which when I started at NCU, they highlighted that it was like the APA manual on steroids. That was the description I was given. 
And then Grammarly, another resource that you can get access to. Just so many different things. And then coming back to my little corner of the world in the proofreading service, that is a paid service that we offer to students to offer feedback related to APA grammar and formatting. Um, students are able to use us at any point in their journey. So it's available for master's, doctoral students. We are all national employees. We have earned doctorates. We've been through this journey before. So our highlight is to be a trustworthy resource um, for all you lovely folks. We provide you with a reviewed copy of the document as well as video feedback. It's all about supporting what you are working on. So for students who are any part of the journey, um, especially I'd like to highlight, we offer a free three-hour review for students with a complete dissertation manuscript. So when you got all five chapters, come see us for our sprint to the finish service. Um, but if you're at other points and you're just like, I, I keep getting feedback for, like, on my on my assignment or on this chapter or whatever about passive citations, references, semicolons, huh? <laughs> Semicolons. Semicolons. <laughs> Hello. Whatever. We can look at a chapter. We can look at an issue. These are asynchronous sessions, so it's not live. But um, that also means you don't have to worry about like, I signed up for an 8 a.m. session and I got to work. It's like, no problem. You will get the feedback via the session within three days of your appointment date. Um, and Hello. Keep moving oh, forward. Yes. Hello. I'm sorry. I know we only have two minutes. I wasn't trying to interrupt to let her do her closing. I just wanted to ask. I'm in my second class and the one I'm struggling with is synthesis. And I know you just mentioned that word. I just wanted to know exactly where in the um, academic success center that I can find the synthesis. Absolutely. So if you go on our ASC homepage and on the left side, there's a menu and it's got group sessions. So there's a weekly group session. We got one on synthesizing literature, analyzing literature, synthesis and analysis. So with the group sessions, up to seven people can sign up. We also do one-on-one -on -one sessions. So if there's something you're specifically struggling with, go into ASC chat and reach out to them. They can help you schedule one-on-one -on -one with an academic coach. What they'll want to know first up is what you're, what you're focused on. Is it writing? Is it qualitative research, quantitative research? So they can get you connected. But the group sessions, you can sign up for that all on your own. Do they have a pre-recorded already for the synthesis um, workshop? No, those are live sessions. So okay. those are, they do record it. So you could watch it after. Okay. Um, we do have some resources on our page, but we don't have any video recordings. Of and where sessions. would the resources for the synthesis be under the same um, writing resources? If, if you go up on the top of it, kind of like where there's a search bar that you can put synthesis in, that'll help you. Okay, find cool. Synthesis. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Absolutely. Lovely questions. And Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for coming today to present uh, for the series. And I appreciate all of the students uh, and staff as well, too. Faculty, I saw some comments in there, too, uh, for attending and providing support for, for our students here at uh, National University and our legacy NCU students. So until the next time, I hope you all have a great rest of your day.